peer review, I think, can only work really well, even in this sort of adjusted peer review, if there is diversity of thought. So you've probably heard me talk on this channel a few times about the peer review process on the one hand, but also um, the retractions, the strange things that have been coming up. And I mentioned it in passing, but I haven't been able to get into it in depth is the disgusting uh, retraction of the article on rapid onset gender dysphoria by uh, Suzanne Diaz and Michael Bailey. But um, that made absolutely no sense, that retraction. It might be technically accurate, but they haven't been enforcing the rules, as as Lee and I discussed. And speaking of Lee, he mentioned it during our last side chat Saturday that he was uh, one of the founders of a new society, the Society for Open Inquiry in the Behavioral Sciences, um, which has a journal of its own, the Journal of Open Inquiry in the Behavioral Sciences, uh, Joids and Soids. In interesting acronyms. Acronyms are fun when you get into get into this <laughs> kind of field. But um, he recently announced this on Unsafe Science Substack, which if you are not subscribed, you should be. Um, for that, there's lots of good stuff that goes on over there. And um, I wanted to bring this up because it's an interesting thing. The the two, um, two editors, the editor-in-chief, Lee and Corey, the associate editor, have written about it. Um, and there's some interesting things here. And despite the headline that you can see there, conventional peer review is broken... Um, plainly obvious from reading through it that they don't think that there should be no review, that peer review is an utter waste of time, garbage entirely, but the conventional process is probably not working right. Um, and I probably agree to a certain extent. I don't necessarily fully agree with that, but um, then again, I come at it from the physical sciences, so I... <laughs> <laughs> I um I may end up deferring a little bit because I imagine it is a touch different in social sciences um versus in the physical sciences. But to that end, uh let's see. The Journal of Open Inquiry and Behavioral Sciences, JOIDS, is an initiative, is an initiative rather, of the Society for Open Inquiry in the Behavioral Sciences. Oh yeah. And what I should say, one of the reasons why this makes sense to me to talk about is one of the big concerns going forward in not just social sciences, but really in any scientific discipline, is being able to freely explore something, <laughs> um, to have open inquiry of something, even if you fundamentally and utterly disagree um, with the findings or the approach or the question being asked. The important thing about the principles of scientific inquiry is that it be a significant question. And it may be a significant question that you don't like. You still need to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> let's see. This essay was written by Corey Clark and me. Collaborative, we, collaboratively, we are among Soib's 10, 10 Soib's founders. I am the editor-in-chief and Corey is the associate editor. Um, <clears throat> conventional peer review is broken. It never delivered what it promised. Uh, assurances that only the best, most credible true findings would make it into peer-reviewed literature, despite involving an immense cost in person power and actual dollars. Okay, uh, at a point on that, technically speaking, he's not wrong. <laughs> There's been a lot of garbage and fraud that has made it through peer review, and admittedly, the one the one that immediately leaps to mind is um, Alfred Kinsey and John Money, <laughs> actually, both of whom were found to be fraudulent decades later, I believe, if I remember correctly, at least with, at least that was the case with John Money, because John Money's original research, um, the Reimer twins experiment, the rather infamous Reimer twins experiment, was found to be fraudulent in 2000. Um, and his clinic that was founded at Johns Hopkins was shut down um, after his death, I believe, because of the fraudulent research, not to mention the other horrendous things that were going on there. Um, I'm not going to get in detail about that just because I'm hoping to get into a series on this channel on um, profiles of pseudoscientists <laughs> just to give you all some uh, fun taste there. And I think John Money's on that list. But um, he's not, so Lee is not wrong. Um, be, and, and the question, of course, is, you know, why that kind of failure? 
uh, why that kind of failure um, of that. That's not to say that everything that comes out of peer review is bad. That's not true. And that's not the point that Lee made on Side Chat Saturday. It's not the point that I make. It's not the point that anyone makes. But it's a point that just because it made it through peer review doesn't make it established fact in literature. It needs to be tested, tried, retested over and over and over and over again with different methodologies and what have you before you get anywhere near accepting it as <laughs> consensus in the scientific process. It's slow and deliberative for a reason. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> journal prestige off is often taken as a marker of quality. Prestige is usually highly correlated with impact, whatever the heck that is, usually some function of citation counts. Amusingly, however, there is little to no connection between prestige, impact, or conventional measures of scientific quality. See the extensive list of references at the end. Yes, we'll talk about some of that. <clears throat> Let's see. Conventional journals instantaneously retract papers because of mobs and take years to retract papers because of fraud. Um, yeah. What I just mentioned about John Money versus Diaz and Bailey. Diaz and Bailey ended up being retracted because people were upset about the content of the paper, not because there was anything fraudulent done. Um, <clears throat> existing journals contribute to publication bias by incentivizing scholars to report only their statistically significant tests and perfect package of studies. Existing journals delay scientific progress by sending papers through multiple rounds of revision, each lasting several weeks or even several months. Existing journals routinely kowtow to outrage mobs. I don't know that I would necessarily consider it routinely, but um, I have to look at this reference here. But that's a whole other thing. Don't worry. Not, not important to the moment right now. <clears throat> and retract offensive papers that show no evidence of fraud, plagiarism, or mistreating participants, and yet take months, sometimes years, to or decades uh, to... You know what? I don't know what I'm going to have to go look because I don't think John Money's research shown to be fraudulent was ever actually formally retracted. I don't honestly know. Total, total other thing. To retract papers after being shown they were published with bona fide fraudulent data. <clears throat> and that does, does happen. Um, the two the two prime examples of recent recent things, and I think the mobs retracting thing is much more... Nowadays, I don't think that was in the previous case, and I don't think it's well. See, here's a it, there's an interesting question there because if you're publishing something that somebody's going to be offended by, well, yes, you're going to have potential for a mob and a retraction and all those other kinds of things, um, for sure. But if you're afraid to publish something that's offensive, what have you? Well, you don't have the retraction, but then the paper is not published and you don't have the mob, so you don't have the large numbers of, in terms of like percentages of papers published or percentages where this happens to, the percentage becomes relatively low, maybe because you're afraid, but then maybe it's also because it could be, yeah, it may be an offensive paper, but it also may be a junk paper that is actually being caught. Anyway, bunch of thoughts all at once. Um, conventional journals unjustifiably prioritize reviewers over authors. Existing journals prioritize reviewer and editor perspectives over author perspectives. There's no good intellectual or scientific reason for this prioritizing. Is, it is true that sometimes reviewers make good points and the authors improve the paper by addressing them. I will second this. I will second this because I myself have had papers that I didn't realize I had a nasty, glaring issue hole with. And a reviewer was kind enough to point that out. And I was just like, eh, that makes no sense. Much appreciated. I very much appreciate it. And I always make a point to thank my reviewers in the acknowledgments. Um, <clears throat> or almost always. I think early on I was forgetting to do that. But um, mostly try. Mostly do try to. On the other hand, you can also have reviewers who have ego trips <laughs> let's put it that way um i have had that happen too um but it is also true that reviewers sometimes make bad points and when editors prior to prioritize reviewers it can cause authors to make changes they believe worsen the paper um yeah that can happen uh can relate it to the ego trip thing um but oftentimes that can be ameliorated if you have a good editor. Um, and a good editor does that mediation between 
reviewer and author. Um, and sometimes it takes more than one editor. I've heard of that happening in a couple of different journals where you, <laughs> where you go back and forth and there's multiple reviews of something and you can't get mediation and what have you. And sometimes another editor comes in or another bring in a separate reviewer and what have you. And that's where a lot of the arguments come in. <sighs> Furthermore, it is true that reviewers sometimes make just make annoying trivial points and even though addressing them may not worsen the paper, doing so can be a ridiculous time suck for an author who might have been able to accomplish something worthwhile without that now forever lost time. That does happen too. Um, again, I think that comes back to the mediation with the with the editor because sometimes editors are kind enough to recognize that that is a forever lost point, but that is a whole other thing. Um, and admittedly, this is probably going to come up with this particular journal too. I don't think just because it's a new journal is going to be necessarily immune from that. Um, worst, most existing journals hold themselves and their authors to radically different standards of accountability. There is no accountability for reviewers. If they are hostile, petty, and counter-constructive, the worst that happens is the editor ignores them. More likely, the editor will treat their comments as serious criticism, and now authors have to deal with arrogant, overconfident, demanding, incompetent, or ax or excreting militant. Wow, uh, as if they are scientifically serious. Um, that can happen for sure. Um, that can happen for sure. I I I can imagine that would be the case. Um, but this is this does seem to be the case of what is the editor prioritizing if they're prioritizing the fact that they need to have good stuff in the journal then they need to do the job of mediating between the reviewer and the editor and uh, reviewer and the author excuse me um so hopefully they're doing that but indeed there are many times when they are not so um <clears throat> so this is not a knock for me at least is is not a knock on all peer review i actually do know a lot of great editors who do very good jobs by by their um by their journals but lee is also not wrong that peer review is a touch of a mess at times um and like i said it doesn't prevent some bad research from making it through it never it never is able to prevent that and partly that's just because we're human um <clears throat> another topic for another day Conventional journals are riddled with biases. Existing journals prioritize the work of certain types of scholars, prestigious ones, creating a Matthew effect in which the rich get richer. Existing journals prioritize certain types of findings, surprising and novel ones. Uh -huh. um, the most likely to be incorrect. What the heck? Okay, I didn't know you could do that. What the heck? Um, I didn't know you could do that with Substack. That was different. <laughs> Um, at the expense of higher quality but less flashy findings. So this goes back to that thing about impact factor. A lot of that has to do with citations, the number of citations. Um, and don't get me wrong, there there is that is some there is some value to that metric in that more people are reading your work and your stuff is getting out there and hopefully it's sparking other research ideas and something like that. There is a bit of that there. But how do you get a lot of those citations? It's, well, something that's really going to catch someone's eye. Um, and I've seen some interesting names of journal articles at this point that are just partly of that goal, you know, get people reading it. But, um, yeah, the, the, the thing that says it's, you know, it's not flashy. Well, it worked out the way we thought it was going to. Or, uh, oh, yeah, this, this thing that we already know about. Yeah, we've re reconfirmed it. People don't necessarily think that that's worth publishing, but it is. It is. And it should be published regardless. And that's, and that is a true thing to be worried about is that if it's, you know, if it's reconfirming something we already know, or, you know, it's not flashy, it doesn't make a splash in any particular way. I mean, <laughs> it's annoying that it doesn't, but that doesn't make it any less of poor quality. If, 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 Prioritizing impact over quality is a bad thing. Let's put it that way. Um, <clears throat> some existing journals obstruct or even explicitly ban findings that violate the current, current editor's moral or political, usually progressive, sensibilities. Uh, yep, there are some interesting things in there. Let's see. Conventional journals are exploitative. 
Existing journals charge thousands for open access or paywall research, so sometimes not even the authors themselves can access their own work. Um, existing journals profit off the free labor of authors and reviewers. Some threaten their authors who post their own work on their personal websites. Existing journals cave to social media mobs and retract papers because they have intense financial stakes in the need of protection. Um, so yeah, I've, I've said this before too, and I think there's a there's something to be said there for the fact that, you know, anyone who submits an article in most journals, you're paying to get it published. You're not getting any money from it. Now, hopefully what you're getting is, you know, decent amount of impact and, well, not impact, but decent amount of getting your name out there so you can get other grants and what have you and build up your credibility and those kinds of things. That's supposed to be, supposed to be the paint it, for lack of a better word. Um, but, you know, it is it is actually really difficult because there's, for, for anybody who's a reader, who's not at a, well, not at a university, but if it's not open access, well, you're basically having to pay subscription fees. <laughs> um, and if you're not at a university, the university pays the subscription fees oftentimes um, for multiple journals. So yeah, no, I can understand that. Um, and there has to be, frankly, a better way for this. But I think, I think one of the things that's going to happen is right now we're in a transition from print publishing to being almost entirely open access. Um, and the big cost that's therein with print publishing is the formatting, the typesetting, all of that kind of stuff, the copy editing, everything like that, that happens after a journal article is accepted. Uh, that's not, that's, that's the part that's the, that is the expensive part actually. Um, because it comes back to all the work of copy editors and things like that and the formatting and printing it and, you know, sending it all out, these books upon books upon books. If you go into a university library, you can find them, um, actually, because oftentimes they'll keep the print copies too, not just give you the electronic access. Um, but I think when it goes to the point that you're not, which I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest, when you're not in print anymore... I do think the cost for open access will eventually go down, but right now, yeah, actually open access is expensive because alongside of the cost of like typesetting and things like that, you have to pay for the open access fees for most journals. That said, there are some journals that just do flat fees now. I think I think this is true of the European Ge Geophysical Union journals in particular, if I remember correctly. Um, they just do a flat fee. You just pay X amount in euros. Um, do the unit conversion, but in euros, um, and you're, and yeah, you get online and it's all mass, vast majority of them are already open access. So it's that kind of thing. So changes are occurring. This is probably a fair one of them. How is Joibs different? We count the ways. Behavioral science needs a new journal, one that eschews these many dysfunctions. We won't contribute to publication bias. Um... <laughs> Let's see. Send Joibs your rejected papers that can't be published elsewhere. Send us your null results, even null results across many studies. Send us your replication studies, even your failed replications. Send us your incremental or niche findings. Send us your findings that disconfirm what every social scientist knows, real or imagined behavioral consensus, behavioral science consensus, famous claims advocated by famous professors at prestigious universities. Send us your politically incorrect or correct findings. Send us your findings that do not fit with other journals. Send us the work you do not wish to publish elsewhere. Send us the work you fear to publish elsewhere. Send us the work you wish to get out quickly. Send us your homeless papers to joy. Send these your homeless papers to Joibs. The lamp of open inquiry beckons and welcomes them all. What oh, clever rephrasing of the social uh, the poem on the Statue of Liberty. We're here to share science, not control narratives. At Joibs, your paper will be evaluated and you will receive constructive criticism and feedback. But the publication will not be censored or blocked by reviewers or editors, subjective judgments, biases, personal animosities, political axes, or even the great gnashing of teeth being moms. Let's see. Reviews are published. We've all experienced bad faith reviewers who make weak and inappropriate criticisms to kibosh papers they dislike for reasons unrelated to quality. At Joibs, our reviewers are accountable to with all articles, uh, with all reviews published alongside our articles. Reviewing is a time-consuming and thankless job, not at Joibs. Our reviewers get all published 
will all get published as peer commentaries and contribute to the scientific discourse and will be listable as publications on CVs. Okay, that's different. That's interesting. I, I gotta see what I think about that. Um, because I, I do know journals who do publish the reviews currently, at least in the physical sciences, the reviews are publicly available. Um, for example, um, this is true with the uh, European Geophysical Union journals. I've seen it start to crop up in some of the American journals. Um, at least in the physical sciences side, I've seen it. Um, the reviewer is still anonymous. That's for sure. The reviewer is still anonymous, but the reviews are all published, and it is actually citable there, too. It's not published as, like, its own commentary, but it is citable. Um, so it's actually really interesting to see this here that, no, oh, now yeah, you can list it on CVs and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but I would presume that that would mean the reviewer's name is now public. So it's a question of whether or not you like that. I'm kind of iffy on that myself. Um, I'm personally more a fan of double blind peer review. Um, in, in this and rather, rather than uh, single blind. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what I think of having reviewers and, um, authors all know each other, you know, see who's, who's everybody's names is, names are, because I personally am a big fan of double blind because I want it to be about reviewing the art, uh, the ideas in the article. So I'm kind of like, well, let's just, let's just take it apart. Um, I'm going to ignore the name, going to ignore all that. And like I said earlier this week, positionality statements need to go the way of the dinosaur real fast because that's not going to be helpful to anything like this. Um, <laughs> I imagine you're going to run into that in the, in the Joibs stuff, perhaps, is that somebody's going to start trying to publish, well, if they do publish your, um, positionality statements. <laughs> all sorts of fun stuff there. Um, uh, <clears throat> so that'd be curious. Joyce is working hard to expedite the peer review process. It should never take years for a paper to go from submission to publication. We aim to improve our papers in just one round of reviews where feasible and give authors primary control over the revisions they choose to make and the pace of acceptance and publication. Hmm. Where feasible is the thing there because sometimes you go back and forth in reviews and either there's miscommunications or what have you and you, know, you end up doing three or four rounds of reviews because, well, sometimes reviewer and author butt heads. <laughs> but also just because sometimes the author doesn't necessarily write a great article on the first round that is either... Let, let, let's put it this way. Sometimes it's an article that is great content. It's quality. It's really well done. But for whatever reason, the writing style, communication style, the writing of it itself is done to the point that you can't understand clearly what the author's trying to say. And that's one problem. And you can end up going back and forth on that in terms of stylistic things. Now, that, that is something that hopefully Joabes will figure out a good, a good way to do that. I hope for that. I hope for many success with this journal. Um, much success. There we go. <laughs> but the other aspect is of course you're just butting heads and maybe you're an author doesn't want to make a necessary and improvement that a reviewer has identified is critically important not that it's unimportant and you know the reviewer is just picking nits or what have you but that it is actually critically important um that, you know, I they've identified a hole that the whole argument falls apart. Um, or they've identified potential fraud and trying to get the authors to figure out how to get figure out how to do it correctly without the fraudulent work. But anyway. Um do -do 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 -do. well that's nice. Seventy five dollars. That's a nice submission fee. Um let's see. Retraction policy. We base retraction on COPE guidelines, which can be found here. We reserve the right to retract a paper if errors go uncorrected for more than a month, as described in COPE. We will never retract a paper in response to social media mobs, open or private letters calling for retraction, denunciation positions, or if 
or the like if such petitions fail to show blah, that the pay, published paper meets COPE guidelines for retraction. Similarly, authors may only retract their own published papers if they meet COPE guidelines. Critics are welcome, however, to publish their criticism. Um, okay. That I like. Having that stated policy, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Instructions to submit here. Do, 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 do. I'm not going to get too much into that. Um, and at the end, there's some interesting articles. I've read a bunch of these, actually, and, and there's some points to be said that peer review has problems. Um, for myself, with peer review, one of the biggest concerns I've had with it, and I think I said this to Lee, but I also said this to Anna, and I've said it many times over on this channel, is that I think peer review can work to catch most things. Lee is correct that it doesn't that there are plenty of times when some really bad crap has gotten through the system. Um, and it's unfortunately perhaps, perhaps more so. Um, but other times it doesn't. But peer review, I think, can only work really well, even in this sort of adjusted peer review, if there is diversity of thought. Um, if there is actually different perspectives when approaching a problem. Because why? Because you can identify actual problems with how a study was done. Um, or potential biases in an approach or something like that. That you could not identify otherwise if everybody thought about the problem the same way. Um, and so that is that is why I've been concerned for a long while with how um how students are being taught about science and you know the, the culture on university campuses um uh, where we train the next generation of scientists and actually where a lot of this kind of research that is published gets done and published in journals not just social science journals but in physical science journals so that has been my prime concern and i'm glad to see that this this is rising up and coming but um yeah if there's not a whole lot of a wide range of perspectives on these different things in the younger generations then i don't know how much it's gonna work this is the only thing i wonder about in terms of the peer review aspect of it um that's it stuff may get published more because it's you're not necessarily relying entirely on review, though, of course, you got to watch for any kind of fraud and what have you. And I don't think that's, I think that was the only question I didn't see them answer in their own thing here. Now, come to think of it, yeah, I don't, these are published. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. Uh, um, well, re okay, never mind. Retraction, yeah, it's covered in the retraction section. I, what I was going to say is I didn't see how they, how they were going to address issues of fraud. Um, but it's actually right there. Because fraud would fall in under um, under these kinds of things. So, never mind. I am corrected. But, flawed? Definitely. Peer review's got its flaws. I'm not going to lie. It does. Um, and that is my biggest concern, is that, you know, between the combination of so many articles getting published and doing peer review, finding reviewers to begin with who are going to review quickly... Um, is a problem off the top of my head. Um, the concern over the diversity of thought in the view in the reviewer pool is a whole other problem um, in there. So I, I somewhat agree that uh, conventional peer review is pretty broken, but I do agree with the sentiment in general that just because if a study is peer reviewed and it's this new exciting thing doesn't mean it's automatically established as a fact in the field. Um, and we do need to do better about eliminating fraudulent work. Um, so this is really interesting. So this is a new journal. Um, and I'm, there's a lot of new journals noticed <laughs> lately. But um, new journal from the uh, Society of Open Inquiry for Open Inquiry and Behavioral Sciences. So uh, have a read of this and let me know what you think. Hit the like button on the way at the door. Comment on the video. Share the video. Subscribe to the channel. All that lovely good jazz. Until next time, I'm Adrian. May you stay curious, everybody.